for the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Novak. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Here are the stories on today's program. First, Gregory Stockel has a story on Afghan refugees. Next, Anna Mateo brings us this week's words and their stories. Dan Friedel and Faith Perlo report on college athletes for this week's education report. Ashley Thompson has a story about the popularity of instant noodles in Thailand. Finally, Ana Mateo returns with Jonathan Evans for a story on urban mining in Brazil. But first, here is Gregory Stockel. The U.S. State Department has referred more than 5,000 Afghan refugees seeking admission to the United States to a partner program in Canada. Wait times for refugees there are shorter. We are working with Canada to refer up to 5,000 refugees to Canada, independent of our ongoing efforts for U.S. resettlement, a State Department spokesperson told VOA. On the Canadian side, Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada, or IRCC, said Afghan refugees referred by the U.S. are coming to Canada from third countries. They have been living in those countries since fleeing Afghanistan. Newly formed groups like Operation North Star and Task Force Pineapple are working to rescue those still in Afghanistan. Such groups formed after the Taliban takeover of the country last August. But getting people out of Afghanistan is just part of the problem. The Operation North Star website says they have almost 500 Afghans in third countries and more than 2,000 Afghans in safe homes in Afghanistan. The process to move to the United States is a difficult one for refugees. It includes finding safe houses, leaving Afghanistan, finding a third country, applying to a refugee program, and then arriving in a new country. The U.S. immigration system has many complex laws related to refugees entering the United States. The full process can take two to five years. Some private groups are looking to other countries as permanent homes for refugees because of slow U.S. processing. Immigrant-friendly Canada is a favored place. Since October 1, 2021, 133 Afghans have been admitted into the U.S. through the U.S. Refugee Admission Program, or USRAP, USRAP, USRAP. A total 1,554 refugees have been admitted through the Special Immigrant Visa Program. That program is for those people who worked for the U.S. government in Afghanistan. Once the U.S. identifies Afghan refugees who meet certain requirements, they are accepted for resettlement to Canada. Jeffrey McDonald is the communications officer at IRCC. 
He said that as government assisted refugees, Afghans become permanent residents on arrival and can use the country's resettlement assistant program. The Canadian government provides temporary housing and up to 12 months of financial support. McDonald said in an email to VOA that monthly financial support levels for housing, food, and other costs depend on where in Canada the refugees live. They also depend on the size of the family. The Canadian government has promised to accept 40,000 Afghan refugees. That includes the 5,000 people being referred through the partnership with the U.S. Since last August, the country has admitted a little over 8,800 Afghan refugees. I'm Gregory Stockel. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. Spring has come to many places around the world. Here in the Northern Hemisphere, we celebrate the first day of spring on the vernal equinox. In 2022, spring began on March 20th. With new life starting to show in nature, it is easy to see why this season has meant hope and new beginnings to many people throughout history. As a verb, the word spring can mean to come forth with energy. For example, when you spring into action, you start a project or task with a lot of positive energy. Here is another way to use spring as a verb. If you spring news or information on someone, you tell them something without preparation. For example, the other day, a good friend told me she would be moving to a new city by the end of the week. I can't believe she sprung such important news on me. And that brings us to our expression for today's show. Hope springs eternal. Hope springs eternal means that people can always find a reason to hope, even in the bleakest situations. Here, the word bleak means to not have much hope. Eternal means to last or exist forever, without end or beginning. So there is a dreamy quality to this expression. It is actually considered a proverb, a short, well-known saying containing a wise thought. The wise thought here is that we human beings never stop hoping or believing that things will get better. Even when common sense tells us that something will not happen, we still think it will. For example, a group of friends tried to start a business together. Their first three tries failed, but that did not stop them from trying again. You know what they say, hope springs eternal. Here is another example. Even though a woman lost her job, her car, and her apartment all in one month, she still kept a positive attitude. She still had good health and good friends. She asked them for a little help and then started to rebuild her life. For her, 
Hope springs eternal is more than a proverb. It is her life's motto. People who use or believe in this proverb are optimists. They optimistically believe in a brighter tomorrow. A pessimist, the opposite of an optimist, probably won't use Hope Springs Eternal very often, if at all. Language experts say the proverb, Hope Springs Eternal, comes from a shortened line from Alexander Pope's 1732 poem titled, An Essay on Man. He wrote, Hope Springs Eternal in Every Human Breast. And that's all the time we have for this Words and Their Stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. The month of March is important for college basketball players in the United States. On televisions around the country, sports fans watch the big college basketball tournament for men and women. It is an opportunity for young athletes to get attention and become famous. The tournament games are known as March Madness. In the 1970s and 1980s, basketball players like Magic Johnson and Michael Jordan first became famous in March. However, they were not permitted to make money from their fame until becoming professionals and joining the National Basketball Association. After they became professionals, they could get paid by their teams and do advertisements for companies like Nike. Now, however, thanks to a decision by the U.S. Supreme Court last June, American college athletes are now permitted to make money from their fame. The athletes can make money by permitting businesses to use their name, image, and likeness to sell a product. The agreements are called NIL deals. As a result, some university athletes are becoming wealthy at age 20. Others may not become wealthy, but they want money to fall back on. That means they will have some saved money, even if they do not have a long sports career. That is the viewpoint of Deja Kelly, a basketball player at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. The NIL deals are important for female athletes who will not have as many opportunities to make money as male athletes after college. We can't play forever. The ball stops bouncing at some point, Kelly said. She has six NIL deals, including one with a large coffee company and another with a large restaurant group. Many of the deals require the students to place messages on social media apps, such as Instagram and TikTok to reach fans. In others, the students' faces appear in advertisements for businesses in return for money. Some businesses give students money so they can make clothing items with their names or faces. It'll set me up for life, Kelly said, meaning she hopes to not have financial worries in the future. 
Most of the time, it is easier for male athletes to make money with NIL deals because their sports are seen by more people. However, some female athletes are doing well because they are very attractive. Livy Dunn is one of them. She is a 19-year-old gymnast at Louisiana State University. She has about 6 million followers combined on Instagram and TikTok. In a written response to questions sent by the Associated Press, Dunn said she has about 10 NIL deals. One sports media company, Barstool Sports, is making money by paying mostly female athletes to appear in photos and videos on its Instagram page. Another company, Beautiful Ballers, has photos of female athletes wearing very small swimsuits. Masai Russell is a track and field athlete for the University of Kentucky. She has about 20 NIL deals with companies that include media company Hulu and Walgreens, a store that has about 9,000 locations around the U.S. She gets paid to make advertisements on Instagram that show items like clothing and vitamins. Russell said she earns more than $100,000 per year from her NIL deals, but she is trying to be careful with the money. I'm trying to play it out very smart, so that I'm pretty well off in my later years. Gloria Navarez is the top athletics official for a group of colleges in the western U.S., She said she hopes the young women succeed for more reasons than just attractiveness. While some are doing well, not all college athletes are making lots of money. One of them is Bailey Moody. She is a wheelchair basketball player at the University of Alabama and a member of the USA Paralympic team. She said making money from NIL deals is a lot of work. She congratulates those who do on their success. Blake Lawrence works for a company called Open Doors, which helps college athletes find NIL deals. He said most are not making that much money. A good deal might bring in about $250 per month. There is one group of college athletes, however, who are not permitted to make money from NIL deals. International students who come to college in the U.S. on F-1 student visas. Lee Cole is an immigration lawyer in Vermont. She said breaking that rule would have serious consequences. Dorka Juhas is a basketball player at the University of Connecticut. The team is often one of the best in the country. Juhas is from Hungary, so she is not permitted to make money in the U.S. She said other basketball players who stayed in Europe are making money. Juhas called it disappointing that she was not able to make money in the U.S. I'm Faith Perlow. And I'm Dan Friedel. is known for its spicy, complex foods. So something as simple as instant noodles might seem unlikely to be a favorite among Thais. 
but for young Thais, like Rachadapon Krangam, a new store with more than 70 kinds of instant noodles from across Asia, is a popular place to visit. Good Noodle opened in a Bangkok shopping center last October. It has already welcomed thousands of customers. The store offers noodles from places like Indonesia, South Korea, China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. Rachadapan, who is 18, has visited Good Noodle three times already. I love it here because I want to try out new and different kinds of instant noodles, as I want to know how all of them taste, he said. People often eat the noodles in the store, where they can cook their own three-minute meal. Siwayakon Churuntat, another 18-year-old, said the prices were reasonable for students compared to eating at restaurants. Instant noodles are hugely popular in many Asian countries because of their taste, simplicity, and low price. Health experts warn against eating too much of the highly processed food because it lacks important nutrients. Ungkun Wongkuntut runs the store. He said he searched through Bangkok's food stores during the COVID-19 pandemic for all the different kinds of instant noodles. He discovered more than 350 of them. This gave him the idea to open Good Noodle. I wanted to give the customers an instant experience with the noodles, he said, not just buying the noodles from other convenience stores or supermarkets, then forgetting about them at home. I'm Ashley Thompson. In northeastern Brazil, the capital of Alagoas State, used to be filled with the sounds of busy city life. Cars and buses going to places of business, people enjoying daily life, and children playing. But now, the capital, Maceo, is quiet. Most residents have been evacuated. They have left because their now empty houses are falling apart and face destruction. Beneath their floors, the ground is filled with empty spaces from four decades of rock salt mining in urban neighborhoods that caused the soil above to settle and the structures atop the soil to start coming apart. Since 2020, tens of thousands of residents accepted payments to leave the area from petrochemical company Brascom. But some residents remain in Maceo. Some told the Associated Press they imagine the ground under their feet to look like Swiss cheese, meaning full of holes. Still, Paulo Sergio Doi said he will never leave his home in the Pinheiro neighborhood. It is where he grew up. The company cannot impose what it wants overnight to do away with the lives and histories of so many families, the 51-year-old resident said in an interview outside his home. Braskem is one of the biggest petrochemical companies in the Americas. It is owned mostly by Brazilian state-run oil company Petrobras and construction giant Novo Nord. The company is not forcibly evicting anyone, but those remaining in Maceo said it feels that way. Brascom reached an agreement with prosecutors and public defenders to compensate families. This money was to help them relocate, 
and start their lives over elsewhere. By the company's count, 97.4 percent of affected homes, more than 14,000, are now empty. The 55,000 evacuees left behind not just neighbors and friends, but also jobs. Last year, the Federal University of Alagoas published a study. It found that 4,500 mostly small and medium-sized businesses were closed. These businesses employed. An estimated thirty thousand people. Among those businesses were local food markets, and a ballet school, that had operated for thirty-eight years, said Adriana Capretz. She is part of the university's work group that keeps details on the neighborhoods. The emptiness of the city is clear from above. The residents who left sold everything they could for extra money. This included the roofing material of their homes. Without the roof tiles, from above you can see clearly inside the once lived-in houses. The amount of money Braskem offered to compensate seventy-seven-year-old retired teacher Natalicia Gonzalez is not enough. She said she was too old to start over somewhere else. Now she lives inside a homemade shelter behind boards and plants. These are aimed at preventing would-be thieves. Braskem security guards patrol the city on motorcycles at night. This briefly breaks the city's strange silence. They've done everything to force me to go, but I have my rights," she said from behind her home's protected outside barrier. She said she is especially afraid at night, when no one is around, and there is not much light. As of yet, no house has been swallowed by the earth, nor has anyone been killed by a collapse. However. Kapretz, a professor in the university's architecture and urbanism school, said that does not mean this is not a tragedy. Sitting at a table beneath the light of the street's only working lamp post, sixty-four-year-old Quiteria Maria da Silva and her grandson wait for the rest of their family to play a game of dominoes. Even as De Silva said she would move where Bras came to pay her requested amount, she is left with a big question. I always lived in my house, and now if I have to leave here, where will I go? The company's press office said in a lengthy response to AP questions that it provides free mental health services to any resident in the compensation. And relocation program. It said the program was created based on law and legal rulings in similar cases. The company added that compensation offers are always presented to individuals alongside their lawyer or a public defender. But these offers can be made more complex by intense feelings. The price of a house is not the same as the value of a home. I'm Jonathan Evans, and I'm Anna Mateo. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Dan Novak.